Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. I mean, obviously, first off, just, I mean, congratulations on the short and just thank you so much for the time today. I really, you know, I had so much fun with it. Great. Thank you so much. I'm excited to talk about it more. It was only, it was too short for me. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess that dovetails into the first question. Like, how do you get a pitch to do something like this? Because I mean, I didn't even know bite-sized Halloween was a thing. Yeah. You know, I, when I was introduced to it, I was sent a few episodes and I was hooked. I was immediately hooked. I was very impressed at the level of storytelling that I was seeing. Um, I was entertained and I, you know, I'm a little bit of a, of a um, pussycat when it comes to horror. I have to, you know, it's like, I have to have horror that in a weird way, either it is unbelievable. <laughs> so I don't actually carry it home or I have to have horror that really speaks to me on some thematic level. Um, and for me, this was one of those series where every short that I really enjoyed watching got very quickly to the theme, uh, raised some very interesting questions and also was entertaining visually as a horror. Now, I mean, there was a very salient theme, obviously, for yours. Now, I mean, walk me through, I guess, the origin of that on your end, why you want to tell this particular story. Well, um, a few years ago, my son in kindergarten, he's in a Chinese language program. I'm actually wearing the school colors here. Um, uh, he brought home a, a Chinese story that he was supposed to study, and it was really about the, the Nian and the monster, the Nian, and why Chinese New Year is the way it is. And the reason why Chinese culture has fireworks and why we paper our houses in red and put out signs of good luck is to ward off evil and this monster, the Nian. And I had never heard of this uh, myth before of this monster coming down from the mountains and um, eating people hungry for villagers uh, until my son showed me the story and my, my imagination was, was piqued. So um, that's where that I got the original idea from. And when this came up, I thought it would be funny to, to watch a child fe feed racist bullies to a monster <laughs> on Chinese New Year's. Um, and that was sort of the original idea. <laughs> I love it. Now, I mean, something I appreciated about it is that it's, from a visual standpoint, it's not obviously because you're having this reveal of the the Nian, but it's not it's not in our face. It's almost kind of done in the shadows it, rather than sort of shoehorning in sort of a bad visual effect shot kind of thing. How important was it for you to 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 keep this creature and keep it feel like to give it a very sort of tactile feel as opposed to something that maybe was just pasted on the screen? Yeah, I that was a big part of the concept is to keep everything um, practical as and I really wanted to create a sense of theatrical poetry that um, because the Nan is um, coming from a cultural place, I really looked at, um, you know, there isn't a lot of Chinese horror that exists because of censorship yeah. in China. And also, you're not allowed to make horror. Um, because there's you, ghosts are not allowed in Chinese censorship when it comes to filmmaking. So a lot of the inspiration I was pulling from was from classic Japanese horror and some of the ones like um, Onibaba, um, um, Kwaidan. These films for me are really sing because poetically they're talking about really um, interesting human themes and visually it's pulling from a kind of theatrical style. So that was really the concept to try and preserve that. And I'm a big fan of Buteau and uh, I really have always thought Buteau is such a fascinating dance form. I wanted to incorporate that in terms of creating the Nian. And so it was a very big part of the direction, which is to keep everything in camera and not resorting to visual effects un you know, unless we had to. No, I mean, I'm curious because, I mean, I love that you brought up Onibaba and Kwaidan because, I mean, those are two of my favorite films of all time. They're absolutely fantastic. But, I mean, I'm curious, like, was directing and sort of making things like this sort of always in the offing for you? Because, I mean, you have a pretty extensive career of, you know, being an actor and working on different shows, like it, it's hard to draw a line from sort of showing appearing on NCIS to to being inspired by Qui Don. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's taken me a long time to understand, and I never really wanted to hop into the director's chair until I knew I had something to say. And you know, becoming an actor, trying to master that craft, really has taken me twenty five plus years. And the more I started to 
grow as a person and as a woman, I started to see there were socially relevant, important issues that I just felt weren't being dealt with. Um, and as a writer, I think becoming a mother really exploded my ability to, to see the world through a more writerly lens. Whereas my early 20s, I was writing very personal, per personal stories. I still am. But now I feel just stronger as a writer. And directorially, I feel like, you know, I'm at a place of confidence where I feel like I can sit in that chair and really guide the vision. So I think really, you know, my directing career has been 30 years in the making. <laughs> you know, I'm just finally able to get behind my own self in terms of figuring out how to integrate all of it that I've been learning for the last 30 years. And, you know, it's no small thing that I've been on hundreds and hundreds of sets and becoming a director has made me realize just how much I've absorbed. And horror is uh, surprisingly such a liberating, such a liberating genre visually as a director that I'm really surprised to discover just how much I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I'm curious, how do you think your career as an actor has sort of informed you as not just a writer, as a director as well? Because, I mean, obviously, if you're doing a guest shot on a show, you've maybe only got a few minutes to shine. This is a very short film, but obviously it's to the point. It's getting the point across. And I mean, and it shines because it looks fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I heard all those compliments. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> just in terms of how acting maybe has informed you as a storyteller now. Well. I think as a right as a, as an actor, the thing I've seen the most um, is that actor director relationship. And I have had the good fortune of having many, many good directors direct me. I've also had the fortune of watching many not so good directors. Um, and that's more in the world of watching how they create the tone of a set, how they treat their crew, how how the machine works in terms of the direction coming from the top. And as an actor, I'm always on the receiving end of it because ultimately it comes down to this moment that is in front of the camera. But the world that's created around that relationship between actor and director is so set because there's such an environment that needs to be created so that this magic can happen. And having been privy to that for almost close to 30 years now, I, I've, I've realized that most of acting now um, has prepared me to be a director. So uh, a lot of that kind of experience, nobody can teach you. So if I'm going to be an old, an old a veteran actor at this point, I would also like to put that experience into putting out new stories in the world that I feel aren't being told. And that's kind of where I feel like I'm starting to get behind the driver's seat. Well, and I mean, I would imagine that really allows you to sort of boil it down to just character and sort of the importance of, you know, being with your moment and being in kismet with the actor as well. Because, I mean, I can imagine network TV is probably just a grinding machine that, you know, doesn't necessarily allow for a lot of character driven work. No, it's not. I mean, really, your audition is the performance, you know, and so when you come on, the expectation is you just need to deliver and you don't have very much time. Uh, because you're probably number 10 to 20 on the on the call sheet. So, um, you know, so many good actors in that in that in that um, on that call sheet are forced to act so quickly. And I really respect actors so immensely that I, I feel like uh, what I do bring to the set is a sense of um, true gratitude for what actors have to do. And uh, I feel like that's going to be inherent in, in any any project, which is I think actors will hopefully know that they're in a trusted, trusted hands with me. So I feel like uh, if there's anything I can do on set, you know, without fail, it's work with actors. So are you the actor who finally gets to direct now or were you sort of the repressed director who was acting for years and now finally got to break out and do something on your own? That's exactly what I'm asking myself. Um, I think, you know, we're in a world where multi-hyphenates are allowed to exist. When I first entered, I was, I was um, entered the industry. I was an actor and a writer, but I was very clearly given information that, especially as a woman of color, this is your lane, you pick it and you stay in it. Um, and that's not the case anymore. So many wonderful filmmakers are actor, writer, directors. And now that that model exists, I don't think it's... Um, 
something that I have to apologize for. Uh, whereas in the past, you know, saying I wanted to write something um, and direct it, and I was an actor, felt almost like a power thing. Whereas now, I think people are interested in seeing coherent visions being brought to life and being executed. So I feel like um, this is a great climate for someone like me with my experience. Um, that's a question I continue to ask, whether I'm an actor who's directing or a director who who, who was acting. But I think uh, I don't think that question has to be asked anymore. I feel like both can exist. Well, it feels like the hyphen of two is allowing for more career longevity as well, just in terms of being more versatile and being sort of allowed to to put uh, a wide array of stories out there because there is a demand for them. Yes, I do agree. But I think it also there's a bit of a concern, which is everyone wants to be a multi hyphenate, but you have to have the craft that goes behind it. So I think what, where the, it's very important that al people be allowed the opportunity to express their talent in all the different formats it can be expressed. Skill wise, you still have to develop the ability to write a story, the ability to work with images. You know, all of these things that are required as multi hyphenates, I do feel like I can proudly say that I, I am doing the work to earn that. Um, and I think that's more the caution. And I, I definitely think, you know, of course, go at it and do do all the different skill sets. Just make sure you're also doing the work that 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 it takes to have that title. So do you feel like more stuff along the lines of Nian is what maybe you'd be doing going forward? Because, I mean, obviously some people can do like one seven minute short, it'd be a big hit. And then they try to develop a three hour feature and then it bombs. Like it, yeah. that for you is sort of taking those steps, sort of an important step for you. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, you know, it's you, I, I never, ever feel like I killed the day. <laughs> I feel like, oh, geez, you know, there's so much more I could have done better. Um, but that kind of mindset, that growth mindset is what, what the industry continue continually asks of you anyway. And so you have to be humble enough to understand how you can continue to grow. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of, um, in terms of the next steps, I'm always, always going to try to bite off a little bit more than I can chew. I'm just, I tend to be a little bit more ambitious, but I think it's because I've been kind of yearning to, 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 to flex my muscles. So I think that ambition comes from 30 years of being on sets. Um, however, the humble part of me is to always remind myself, you can be ambitious, but don't reach for something that's not attainable because that will be a setup for failure. So, you know, um, do I think I'm going to go, um, in my mind, can I make 2001 the, the Space <laughs> Odyssey? I would love to. Do I know I could do it? I'm probably not quite there yet. So I will, my next project will be ambitious, but hopefully within my reach. Well, I mean, when you find the middle ground, I can't wait for that. Now, just to, just to put a bow on this, it's a silly question, but it's one I always like to ask. Bring it. You, back to the younger years, was there like a, a, a movie or a TV show or a performance that sort of sticks out in your brain? that had the light bulb go off in your head and made you want to say, okay, I'm, I'm getting into this business? Well, it's not a silly question. Um, I think it's something that all filmmakers are asked and um, not that this is a prepared answer, but uh, I was just asked this recently. And for me, um, when I saw The Last Emperor, that was the movie that really moved me. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm no Bernardo Bertolucci <laughs> quite yet, but it, um, it really, that, that's one of my opening, that's one of my films that really opened my eyes to the power of cinema. Well, you know what? I look forward to your last emperor because I think it's going to be a hell of a piece of work and you're definitely on the right track. And you know what? Thank you so much for the time today. This was fun again. Again, congratulations on Neon. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. Thank no you so problem. much. Andrew, man, I mean, obviously, first off, just thank you so much for the time today. I mean, congrats on the short, man. I loved it. Thank you. Now, I mean, I guess my first question is like, like walk me through getting pitched to be a part of something like this because i mean i'll be honest i'm canadian we we didn't know bite-sized halloween was a thing <laughs> uh so interestingly i had uh, done a short film called the reasonable request that that did the festival circuit and played sundance and and sort of in the afterglow water cooler tour uh met with um the folks at what was then fox digital so right it would have been 2017 and so Live Bait was actually uh, 
in the first round of those initial uh, bite-sized horror films, but it, they were aired on TV, um, who weren't uh, on Hulu, streaming on Hulu yet. Um, so this is sort of back by popular demand. Back, okay, back by popular Hulu. demand. I like that. <laughs> walk me, I guess, like walk me through sort of the origin of this on your end, because I mean, to be perfectly honest, of all the ones I've seen, I think yours is my favorite, because honestly, it's the simplest. It's such a great mm. idea. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it was, you know, gr growing up in Michigan, uh, most of my family are are very outdoorsy and hunters and fishermen and growing up sort of fishing with my grandpa, uh, always sort of thought of fishing as this romantic activity, a, a bonding experience for family. And, uh, and yet the underbelly is, uh, couldn't be more of a horrific thing for the fish. Um, and the more you dig into that, the more cringeworthy it is just the hooks being ripped out of the gills and, you know, all the times that you pierce the eye of the fish. And it's like, God, this has got to be an absolute nightmare for these creatures. And so this is sort of just desserts for the fishermen. Apologies to my grandpa, because the guy is sort of based off the look of my grandpa. Fair enough, man. Fair enough. But I mean, something about this that I also love, I mean, especially in the last couple of years, it really feels like short form work is getting a lot more value these days because I mean, granted, in years past, people would be like, oh, there'd be shorts blocks at festivals or there'd be some animated thing, yada, yada, yada. But people wouldn't necessarily understand it because it wouldn't, it's not something you go buy a ticket for. Mm -hmm. From your perspective as a filmmaker, like, how do you see the value of not just short film, but how it's sort of evolved and changed over the past few years? Well, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, short shorts have always sort of struggled for, for a proper format, haven't they? Like, you know. Early on, uh, you had the benefit of, of screening before features, I right. guess, but that was a very limited supply of short films. Um, and yeah, it is, it's, it's funny because there's all these sort of ancillary couple, uh, companies that attempt to distribute short films. And I, I would wager to some middling level of success. Um, but what uh, 20th Digital has done, I think, has sort of filled a gap in the market that people are really kind of hungry for, which is great short films by uh, great filmmakers on a platform that is accessible to almost everyone. Um, so it's really given, uh, I don't know, given, given a space for, for these shorts to live. Um, and you don't have to do the work to necessarily seek them out like you might for other sites. Right. For sure. For sure. Now, I mean, I'm curious because, I mean, obviously, like you said, there is this sort of you know opening in the marketplace, but it seems like the opening in the marketplace is happening in horror. And I'm curious from mm -hmm. your perspective, what is it about the horror genre that allows shorts to really maybe have more of a chance to thrive? Because, I mean, we're not seeing sort of bite-sized rom-com or bite-sized, you know, mm -hmm. drama little sections. It seems to be in the horror milieu where the short film is really starting to get some traction again. Uh, well, I, you, you could argue that's that applies to to theatrical as well, right? Well, more that's, horror yeah. films every year, um, and horror films are the easiest to get off the ground. Um, I, I think partly because um, scares aren't necessarily that expensive, um, and there's something very primal that can get a reaction out of viewers and doesn't rely as much on, um, you know, uh, massive production value or name actors or, you know, in incredible dialogue. Um, you can sort of service, um, you know, service a very uh, core response in, in viewers. Well, and I mean, it, it allows, it, it opens up so much more of a venue as well to sort of make a statement and say something. I mean, it, you know, even, even with your film, I mean, you can, you know, you can argue the environment or overfishing or yada, yada, yada. But I mean, just sort of the simple idea of what if the fish below the surface were doing what we're doing above the surface? Like, yeah, yeah, right. It's sort of that, that issue of equality, which really strikes me as quite fascinating. And my camera's moving. I don't know why, but all right. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it, um, the, the short actually got picked up a couple of years ago by, um, by PETA. Uh, and it was on the PETA website really? or some or some PETA blog. I don't know if it was the, the front page of PETA, but yeah, d d essentially uh, glorifying like, look, look how pro fish this, this short is. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't the intent really, but um, uh, but yeah, you know, done, done well. I think horror is an incredible vehicle for, for social commentary. And, um, you know, historically, I think the best horror films have that element of social 
for commentary to him. Now, I mean, obviously, budget's going to play a factor in this, but I mean, how important was it for you to, I mean, basically not show the fish? So, I mean, I thought that was the beauty part of it because, I mean, if had there been some sort of wild fish reveal, it would have been a different film entirely. Yeah, it just seemed um, it, it 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 wasn't part of budgetary consideration, but I think it was more just uh, the, the the enhanced creepiness of of the imagined and the right. unseen. Right. Um, I think in a longer theatrical form, at some point, you'd have to pay off a little bit of of what that creature is, what that fish is. Um, but for two minutes, it just seemed, it, it was sort of actually a conscious decision to not e actually go below the waterline either, to not even give that point of view, to mm. just play everything out from the, the fisherman's perspective. No, I mean, this is a dumb question, but it's one I always like to ask. Like, can you think back to the younger days? Was there a movie that you saw or a moment in a movie that had the light bulb go off and say, you know what, I want to get into this business? Mm. God, great question. Um... I don't, you know, I don't know that there's one specific film. Um, I I knew the moment I wanted to go into film and be a filmmaker. Um, and it revolved around reading a, a an autobiography or a biography rather than an autobiography on Spielberg. Oh, wow. Um, but I think, uh, you know, growing up with uh, the Spielberg films, um, once it sort of shifted that like, hey, I like movies so much. I've always liked making stuff. Um, then I started looking at films for inspiration. And I think probably actually being John Malkovich was a really formative film for me. Um, it was sort of like the, the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, the being John Malkovich, a simple plan. Um, City of God, the sort of really interesting, compelling films, Amores Perros came out all around the same time. And I started looking at it through the lens of like, uh, you know, uh, a high schooler, wanting to make movies and those sort of speaking to the type of filmmaker you are as a, as a high school or a college kid trying to be a little more counterculture. Mm. No, I mean, I'm curious because I mean, I asked that question, I mean, in part because I see some pretty epic posters on the wall behind you, but there's also a poster mm. for your short film. And I'm kind of curious, how does it feel as a storyteller to sort of wrap your brain around just being a part of that sort of zeitgeist and that conversation because, I mean, well, obviously you can go, you know, Phantasm or Tarantino and like sort of rank and stage everything, but you've made a film. You have put a film out there. How is it, how is it weird to sort of wrap that, wrap that idea around your brain as you sort of, you know, hang stuff on your wall? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that you could ever, I don't know that the, the posters being on the same wall is any indication of the fact that they should be in the same conversation cinematically but they are um, films so i mean on one end they are in the same conversation though that's kind of my point yeah yeah i guess you know i guess you you, you did a thing and it's out there uh, which is cool um that the that short is kind of fun because it, it just doesn't seem to die it, it always gets uh you know retweeted or blogged or, you know every couple weeks i get an email from somebody saying they'd seen it um so that's cool to know that there's something out there but you know it's an eight minute short it's not you know a feature film or or a body of work but it's a contribute it's a contribution to a body of work i mean and you know what man you're, you're doing your thing and i appreciate that and you know thanks for doing something and putting it out there to the world for us to enjoy man and just thank you for the time today again congrats on the short thank you appreciate that david uh, all right, well, Brandon, obviously, first off, thank you so much for the time today. I mean, congratulations on uh, Mr. Crockett, man. It's a hell of a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed it, Dave. No, I mean, I guess my first question is, like, walk me through sort of getting pitched for Bite Size Halloween, because, I mean, I'll be honest, I didn't know Bite Size Halloween was even a thing. Yeah, so um, I, I met the, um, I, I guess, people from 20th, they saw my film at uh, Beyond Fest, um, and reached out to me and invited me to pitch. And so it came up with a few ideas and Mr. Crockett was the one that really stuck out. And I was happy about that because that was one that was, um, I think the most ambitious to me and really stuck out. Uh, and one that was probably more, most excited uh, to be selected, so. And you know, it's a very relatable one too, because I mean, obviously, I mean, as when we're all kids, we all have that one show or that one thing that we're obsessed with that we can, you know, run onion skin thin as you did with the, you know, back in the old VHS days. But like, yeah. 
for you, where did the character come from, from Mr. Crockett? Was it just one, just sort of that idea of sort of the nostalgia? Yeah, it definitely was. Uh, you know, Mr. Rogers was a heavy inspiration. Uh, and then I would say t- today, like Blippi was an inspiration because right. I, I have a four and one year old son. My four year old is very, very active. He is the major character, except a lot even more. Um, he's crazy, but he gets very obsessed over shows. And I remember when I was young, I was the same way. I was very obsessed over certain shows. Uh, even today, I'm still obsessed over those shows I watched back then. Uh, and so um, that was the original inspo of that. And I've had many of these scenarios where in the morning, like happened like before taking him to school, even where this exact scenario would happen, where I would just like be screaming at the top of my lungs in the living room at him. And uh, one day, cause I, and I even like pause uh blippy as well one time and he like flipped out went crazy and i was going in on him on him as well um and i thought later that night i'm like man what if blippy like came over here with my ass you know or something and then i was thinking i'm like oh okay that'd be you know and i put that idea kind of away in like my notes app <laughs> uh um and then the ring was the inspo for as far as like the tv scene mm-hmm. um but uh, I wanted to just take a s- different approach. I wanted, I really wanted him to break out the TV. And so, um, yeah, I, I just really wanted to be as if Mr. Crockett was rising from hell to get this kid to bring him back into his world. Well, and I mean, that's something I appreciated, it, but particularly about the reveal, because I mean, I can imagine the temptation could have been there to like fill it with blood or to fill it with a bit more sort of, you know, you know, stuff as it were. but. It was clean, it was simple, but it was that much more terrifying. Like, can you talk a little bit about just particularly that effect? Because I loved how you pulled it off and just how he comes out and he is completely mm-hmm. gnarled up. But it's not necessarily, it's scary, but it's not gory. Yeah, yeah. So with that one, um, we had uh, two TVs, uh, one that was full and one that um, we took the front and back out. Um and the prop stylist I worked with was amazing, um, who we just had like a bunch of just fake rubber rubber glass. But that was really something where it's like a step by step moment um, because it was really hard to get Mr. Crockett in the TV frame with that back out and be in a position to where like the TV's leaning this way. But his body is basically bending like he's swaying his back, you know, as his legs are going back. And so we didn't have much time. And also each take, he's constantly spitting out blood. Um, I wanted to be as if like, yeah, like her slamming this was really like slamming his his face on the ground as if he was like live within that TV. Um, so I really wanted that to show and I wanted it to be a slow process and not like a quick just because I wanted to really hear all the sounds of him uh, like grunting and just like, no, those are certain things that I think would even like certain grunts like that, that from like Candyman, you know, whenever he would strike a victim. Right. And so just kind of like hinting at that a little bit, it's like a heavy inspo. And in general, just seeing this like this this older black dude, like he's from the 70s, like crazy as hell. When before he was just a charismatic person and singing the same song. And so when you hear that song, it's like, oh, this is like a totally different meaning now. Um, and so I really just had fun with that. And I saw just like the endless possibilities where I could actually take this character. Now, I mean, for you, what is it about horror as a genre that allows for so much freedom because i mean i love that you bring up candy man because i mean in your short like you know obviously you're making a commentary on just sort of you know single parenting and just sort of the stresses therein, but you're still wrapping it in sort of the horror motif and i'm kind of curious from your perspective as a filmmaker what is it about horror that allows for so much more freedom because if you're trying to tell a certain story but in a drama or in a comedy you're going to be a lot more limited Mm -hmm. i think it's just the ability to bend reality and the fact that you could build that um, that horror within these dark corners. And like a lot of times, like people like it's always that kind of what if, I think, in general. Um, and I think just something happened to me when I was really young. I remember what it was. I saw Unfitting Punishment, uh, Tales from the Crypt ep- episode that just terrified me as a kid. And I was like, man, why is this uncle so mean? I can't believe it. And uh, I remember waking up later that night and I, I, I saw the kid in my doorway, you know, with, with his legs cut off on crutches. And it did something to me to where, like, I wanted more of that, even though it terrified me. 
And I was just very curious the possibilities, like one of my favorite films, the, the Thing, and just seeing um, creatures evolve from human subjects. And so like seeing that transition, that transformation of a character, um, I, it was very intriguing to me. And just really building this world like 1990s it, like that scared the shit out of me. When oh I was God, man, me too. And so just like thinking of like, wow, like Mr. Crockett was the head of the inspo from this too, because he would take kids as well. And so like, you and when you're in Mr. Crockett's world, it's a totally different thing from the real world. And so just like, I was really thinking long form to help me tighten up the short form version of it. But you know what though? I mean, and there's something about working in TV as well, because I mean, obviously there's going to be certain more restrictions and it makes you think a little bit more psychologically as opposed to just the jump scare or the gore. It really allows you to sort of get time with a character. And I mean, for you, when you're developing something, like what do you focus in on? Is it the character? Is it the premise? Like what for you is the crux is your way into a story? Um, Character, a character and environment that I'm putting them in Uh, for this one. um, I was specific to 1995. And so with that, I'm building around like the style, the culture, what pocket of this culture during this time period, um, just stylistic choices. Um, and in general, I, I made this character more like uh, like set it off was a heavy inspo men's society as far as far as like the environment and the wardrobe, because I used to love these films but I never saw horror versions of it growing up and I wish I did. And so like, I'm also like a big fan of Tales from the Hood, um, but I wish that we had more films like that. Uh, and really just stuff that kind of like dives into the dark side of certain cultures, um, just because, yeah, just thinking of the deeper meaning of Croc- Mr. Crockett and like how does it get to the point to where these parents trust to buy this guy for their kids. And that was a big thing too. Cause I'm like, if I miss Mr. Crockett white, would this parent buy this for her kid? You know, compared to like, would they buy a Gullah Gullah Island instead? Or have them watch Sesame Street with more diverse to have like type of role model. I'm like, oh, okay, well, Mr. Crockett could be that role model. They see him a clean cut, enthusiastic guy helping the kids learn singing. Sure. Yeah, But no, <laughs> he's not that guy. And so just thinking like, how do we build that to where he may seem trusting on that side? to be revealed like scary than the other no for sure man it it, it allows for layers and you're, it, it, you do it really well with this piece and i mean i'm just kind of curious for you as a, as a as a filmmaker as a fan like was was there a movie or a moment that you like watched as a young man and sort of had the light bulb go off and be like yeah i want to get into this business um i say i didn't want to i mean i honestly did not want to i didn't try to get into this business until um as far as horror filmmaking about like I guess six years ago okay. uh when I was young it was just like I was just a heavy fan and I think throughout my life like I I, I played football um uh, up through college um so like my life was kind of away from horror in a way but I've always like found my head going back to it and so I think once I really accepted like that I do love horror <laughs> and then I just heavily leaned back into it um so I, I say that's kind of like how everything went. <laughs> well, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's one of those things. I mean, as I watch, as I watch the entire Bite Size Halloween lineup, it really seems a lineup that's full of filmmakers and storytellers who are have a very keen sense of what came before them as they try to tell new stories. And I'm kind of curious for you, how important is it to just be a fan if you want to try to make other films? Because, I mean, some people try to go in, you know, blank slate and not have sort of influences around them, but other people obviously are very influenced by other stuff that they see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I say it's very important to have um, those references, especially within horror, just because, like, you need to know your audience. Um, And there's so many different pockets of horror and audiences that like certain types of horror and so i think it's really like you really need to know what they really like like what they truly like like what is their all-time favorites within this type of horror you're trying to make to satisfy them yeah you know like unless you're trying to make a movie for yourself which is you know which is great i'm always making a movie myself but i want to make a movie that i like but also i know like certain true horror fans may like it may like may not be and if it is for the commercial person cool but I try to make it for people who actually really like horror. For sure. For sure. I mean, you know what, man? I think you've done that with this because, I mean, there's a real visceral 
really kind of crept me to the edge of my seat as I watched it, man. And I mean, it's a hell of a lot of fun. And, you know, just congrats on being part of the lineup. And thank you so much for the time today. Dave, thank you so much. All right. Well, Rebecca, just officially, obviously, first off, just thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm so excited. To now, I mean, I guess my first question is, like, admittedly, shamefully almost, I didn't know Bite Size Halloween was even a thing. Like, do you get pitched? Like, do, do, or do you send in pitches? Like, how does this whole process work? Walk me through that sort of those, those initial steps. Well, the exciting thing is I watched Bite Size Halloween, like seasons one and two, like last year and before when it was on. So it was really exciting to actually get an email from them. Uh, Kate and I made a horror before called Wild Bitch that was in South by Southwest. That's where it premiered. And so someone from 20th Digital saw it and they reached out to us and asked us to pitch some shorts. And so we pitched three shorts that could have the potential to maybe one day become features. And they picked the most normal one. <laughs> and uh, that's Bad Rabbit. <laughs> No, I mean, I guess that dovetails into the expression because, I mean, Bad Rabbit is just, I mean, okay, this is my podcast, we can swear. It's fucked up, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Like, walk me through sort of the origin of this on, on both of your ends. So, you know, Kate is a musician, kind of world-renowned, you know, rock star. And so years ago, uh, Kate and I met on Glow on Netflix, and we've been working together, you know, as actors, but then we decided to start creating together. And she put me in her music video for a song called Life in Pink, and I was a rabbit in that and it was just supposed to be cute and between takes i started doing this voice and so i was wearing this like really cute outfit prosthetic rabbit face and then i was doing this voice between takes <laughs> and they started filming me on their phone and we just filmed like 30 sketches between takes of the music video and started i just said the most filthy vile uh disgusting things but also i had my, um you know the right politics i'd say um and so i would uh you know advocate for certain things and themes that sort of we care about but through this crazy voice just improvise so that was several years ago that was like in 2018 did nothing with it and so when we were pitched this bite size halloween opportunity i we sort of were like what if we took bad rabbit and made bad rabbit like that's what we called my weird behind the scenes improvised character but like what if we made bad rabbit like an imaginary character and we and that kind of like a drop dead fred situation a beetlejuice situation and decided to create an imaginary friend uh, who was deranged and convinced kate's character elspeth to do really bad things to her horrible mother and um so that's kind of how we came up with it. I, I loved Drop Dead Fred when I was a kid. I also had five imaginary friends when I was little. And uh, my dad accidentally flushed one of my imaginary friends down the toilet. And um, he had no idea. I cried after he did it. And I was like, you flushed Kickily down the toilet. Uh, and he was like, what? <laughs> so I think I always had a weird sense ability even so when I was a little kid. And so it's fun to sort of take all of that and put it into Bad Rabbit. No, I mean, I guess that dovetails into the next question because, I mean, obviously Bad Rabbit is... Well, I mean, to say that this character has no filter would probably be sort of a, a, the most politically correct way to just sort of describe it. But, I mean, at the opposite end of the spectrum, Kate almost has to play it straight. Like, how did you get any work done? Oh, yeah, we were laughing a lot. Although... She's used to my antics uh, and I'm used to hers. So, you know, we had to do a lot of work when we were working together on Glow and even when we made our film Wild Bitch and all that, we have to do a, a lot of work to not laugh at each other because we will sometimes on purpose try to make the other person laugh. So um, yeah, it was it was uh, hard for Kate to play it straight, but I think she really did get into the character. And then also the woman, Melinda Decay, who played the mom was so evil, such a nice lady in real life, so evil on screen. So even that, I mean, every time we called cut, we were all laughing and being like, oh my God. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm kind of curious because, I mean, obviously you and Kate met on Glow. And I mean, how often do these sort of creative moments or creative pairings sort of happen 
in situations like that, because I can imagine there'd be situations on Glow where maybe you'd be both in the background of a scene and just sort of joking around, or it'd be a question of, okay, go to your, you know, go over here. We don't need you for a little while. Where does, like, is that where these things sort of get birthed? Yeah, I mean, truly we all, as a collective on that show, we all just had so much time together and there was so much trailer time and antics and craziness. And then also Kate actually currently is working on, uh, she has an off Broadway show that's about to premiere. And one day she played the music for me. I was at her house. She just played the music for me. And just because I'm an asshole, I started acting out all the songs. And so Kate just sat there while I, she played the whole musical and I acted it all out for her to laugh. <laughs> and we just like have fun in that way. And um, she was like, I wanna work with you forever. And I helped her kind of come up with concepts for her music videos. And then we started collaborating on possible show ideas and movie ideas. And we're actually developing something for the UK right now for her to star in. And so we just have so much fun together as friends. And then we make each other laugh in a way that's like, you know, Kind of like I haven't laughed like that since I was a, just a young lass at sleepovers uh, saying inappropriate things when I was 13. And now I get to do it at my old middle age. <laughs> now, I mean, I've got to ask, this might be a bit of a loaded question, but because I mean, I, I mean, I was a big fan of the show, Glow, obviously, but for that show, you had to have a certain degree of physicality with the training that you guys had to do. It feels like it's translating over into Bad Rabbit a little bit, just in terms of the physicality of the comedy. Like, how important is it for you? I mean, especially on something like this. I mean, I felt it as I was watching it, either as laughing it or even in the violence of it. Like, I felt, like, I literally felt it. How important was it for you to sort of really get sort of a sense of physicality with this piece? Well, I think Bad Rabbit, yeah. The, the character, I can kind of get into the character through the physicality and I've been a comedian for like 20 years and most of my characters come from the physicality so like I can even as an improviser I can just sort of like do something where I hunch my shoulders or I have my stick my chest out and that gives me a character so I am a physical comedian like in general and so that's why glow is so perfect because I got to be a physical comedian in a different way and also learn how to fight which us learning how to fight was like the best thing that ever happened to us. And now we want to always put stunts and fights and everything. In fact, I was Melinda's body double when, <laughs> when she uh, when she had to get hurt and thrown. I was wearing my rabbit prosthetic. I was wearing a, a double of her clothes and I had to really hide that um, my crazy face um when she gets thrown out of the wheelchair I threw myself onto the the ground and then it, you know cuts to her so we uh we are always using the skills that we learned on glow but I definitely brought my physical comedy that I was working on for years to bad rabbit and kind of bring it to everything that I do it feels like learning how to take bumps in a ring sort of translates to the stand-up world a little bit. Oh yeah, learning how to take bumps in the ring was was awesome because there's so many reasons why. Part of it was like, it was scary at first. And then once you do it, you're like, it stings a little bit, but it doesn't hurt that bad and you could still exist and live. And it ends up being thrilling. It's like riding a roller coaster. You're like, oh my God, I want to do it again. So now Kate and I kind of put some sort of physicality into everything we do. Now, I mean, for you and Kate going forward, I mean, what is sort of, I mean, obviously, like you said, you've got multiple things in development, but I mean, to to sort of make it through in Hollywood, it really does feel like these days, you can't just be an actor or just be like, you really have to sort of be very conscious of developing as many different sort of projects and ideas, but, you know, maybe still going out and reading something for something at the same time. Like, how important is it, especially in the modern landscape, to to be versatile? as a performer? I mean, I think there are probably some people who just do one thing that's never been me and, and, and Kate, I mean, Kate 
is literally, you know, a musician putting out albums, doing off-Broadway shows, doing TV, writing with me. She's writing a horror novel. And then for me, I'm always writing scripts in addition to auditioning or acting. And, you know, I directed a feature this summer. So it's, yeah, it's really important, especially, you know, in this landscape, what's, it's not just important, it's exciting and there's opportunities where maybe in the past, I think you had to sort of focus on one thing because Hollywood wanted to look at you as one certain thing. And now there's opportunities where we, get to be writer performer directors and in fact like 20th was really excited about the idea that we were going to be directing it and starring in it and Kate wrote the music for it and that was just something that was exciting for them so I think that there's a lot of people in Hollywood now that are excited to like you know be able to hear the the voice behind the face the gorgeous face uh, we're not just puppets <laughs> we're people <laughs> And you know, at the end of the day, you've also got a pro wrestling character now you can break out if you need to, and they hit the circuit in that in that way. You're lucky we're not in person. Otherwise, I'd be headlocking you. <laughs> but you know what? I mean, just to, just 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 a bit of ball on this. I mean, this was so much fun. This this short, and I'm kind of curious for you. Like, was there a movie for a sort of a moment in your life that made you want to get into this business? Maybe not just as an actor, but as a sort of a writer and a storyteller and as a filmmaker and as a comedian as well. You know, I, when I was really little, I watched Tracy Ullman and I was like, that's what I want to be when I grow up. And I remember Tracy in an interview saying that for Halloween, like all the other girls wanted to be beautiful princesses and she always wanted to be ugly or like some sort of witch. And I was like, that's me. Like I, love playing like horrible, twisted, creepy, bizarre people. And I loved doing that as a kid as for bits and for Halloween. And um, it really resonated with me. And I think I was like six years old when I saw that. And her, Carol Burnett, and um, like even watching the Golden Girls, <laughs> which is funny to aspire to be a Golden Girl um, when you're six. But I did. I always wanted to be in comedy. I always wanted to make people laugh. And um, and so I'm lucky that I get to do that in on many different in many different facets. Well, you know what? I think you and Kate have done that with this, but also at the same time really made a interesting horror piece because you, you you've combined the two so effortlessly and it's really so much fun. And thank again, I'm, I'm glad you're a part of Bite Size Halloween and just thank you so much for the time today. Thank you so much. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.